Hey everyone, this is Nick, and if I keep pushing back these Linux videos further down the week, they're gonna end up on Sunday night, where all they'll do is add sadness, because you're gonna have to go to work the next morning. And I say you're gonna have to go to work, because I don't have a real job. Every day's a holiday for me. Anyway, this week we have a sub $10 computer that is capable of running Linux from the Pine64. We have the release of Ubuntu 22.10 and its myriad of variants, and we also have, finally, the end of that old Gnome doesn't have thumbnails meme, because it's gonna get it. And what you're gonna get is this segue to today's sponsor. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this video. Linode is my favorite solution to run a Linux or gaming server. It's what I use to run my own Nextcloud instance and my own only office server. The interface is super easy to use, they are affordable, they have tons of documentation online, and they have one-click deployable servers for a ton of applications or games, like Pi-hole. Pi-hole is a DNS sinkhole that filters out requests to ad serving domains. Basically, it lets you block ads and improve network performance. It lets you actively monitor every DNS request made on your network and block requests as they come in. And you can deploy it in one click on Linode so you can ensure I stay poor. And to get you started, Linode is giving you $100 of free credit to get your own Linux server or gaming server running. To get access to that, just click the link in the description below. So, the Pine64 announced a new board called the Ox64, and it costs less than $10. It's RISC-V based, using a new chipset by Buffalo Labs, a company Pine64 already worked with for various controllers. It has three cores, one for high performance, which is 64 bits, one for high performance, which is 32 bits, and one low power core. They are paired with 64 megabytes of RAM and an SD card interface, and it can run Linux. It also has Wi-Fi 4 and Bluetooth 5, and has various media encoders and decoders, plus two USB ports. It will be available either with 16 megabytes of flash storage and no micro SD socket, or 128 megabytes of flash storage and a micro SD socket to reflect both potential interests, a microcontroller or a complete board. It might prove very useful for anyone into robotics or who's looking for a really, really inexpensive board for home automation and the like. It should go on sale in November at $6 for an RTOS compatible version and $8 for a Linux compatible one. It really goes to show the power of the RISC-V idea or architecture. You can build super small, super cheap CPUs or you can build stuff that is comparable to recent ARM CPUs or even x86. It's just fascinating. Ubuntu 22.10 was released, along with all its official variants using all the various Linux desktop environments. The main version brings GNOME 43, almost intact, with its quick settings, a way better Nautilus with tons of improvements, more responsive applications, a better calendar, and a new overview mode to display all the windows from a specific app, something that existed in Unity, but had disappeared in the migration to GNOME 3. It is not an LTS release and will only be supported for 9 months, with a Linux kernel version 5.19, so no version 6 here, and it didn't ship the new device security panel from GNOME 43 either. Libidvita apps are present and accounted for, and will use the correct theme and accent colors, and they also will use dark mode when enabled. Although apps you install through other means than snaps or repos will have a hard time following these theme changes. All variants also got a bump in the desktop environment they use and various interesting features, notably for Ubuntu Studio, to let you remove some of the default apps it ships with. Of course, I have a dedicated video about this new release and all the major changes in all the major variants, so check out the link in the description or the card up top somewhere, probably here. Looks like we're finally going to be able to put the oldest GNOME meme to rest. You know, the one that nullifies every development GNOME makes because they still don't have thumbnails in the file, open or save dialogue. Well, George Stavrakas shared a short video where he shows that thing now being finally fixed. I guess the transition to GTK4 enabled that, at last, and I, for one, can safely say I'm very happy about it even though most of my GNOME-related videos will now lose about 200 comments. 
Other GNOME-related improvements include the GTK4 port of Epiphany finally being ready. Video Trimmer, a small app that lets you cut videos quickly, has been updated to LibAdvita and it lets you drag and drop files and uses the new About dialogs. Tube Converter, a video downloader acting as a front-end for YouTube downloader, is now available. It uses LibAdvita as well and supports multiple downloads at once with various file types including audio and video. It's already on Flathub. Tagger has yet another release to submit tag metadata to Acoust ID. It lets you right-click music files to access a context menu, and various actions now need to be applied by the user to avoid unintentional data loss. Gyrans, a Plex desktop client, has started its port to GTK4 and LibAdvita, and now supports video playback on Wayland. Extension Manager now has an adaptive interface, lets you check for extension compatibility before upgrading, and hides unsupported extensions by default. Flatseal, the Flatpak permission manager, also got an update with support for the new GPG agent permission. And finally, Bottles has a better interface with more legible and clear names for various options. And at least two of these applications will make their way onto my computers. Those are Tube Converter and Video Trimmer, because the apps I use currently to do this are really old, don't integrate well, and don't work all that well. So as always, props to the GNOME developers and GNOME app developers for making it one of the best Linux app ecosystems out there. KDE's Real Life Conference Academy has concluded, and one talk grabbed my eye specifically, as it's about how to put KDE in more hands through pre-installation on hardware. And since that's kind of my own old dead horse that I beat very regularly, I wanted to see where they were at. He points out that it's really important to get free software into more hands to avoid either the proprietary spyware or the subscription models that hold your data hostage. He also says that hardware is the best entry point because people don't change the defaults and hardware is how they get their software. Plus hardware makes money, which is always helpful. The more they partner with hardware vendors, the more feedback they will also get, which is also crucial. Recent initiatives where KDE was put on hardware include the Steam Deck, which has helped them fix a lot of bugs. They also have the Pine Phones for Plasma Mobile, helping developers making their software convergent with Kirigami. They have the Mycroft Home Voice Assistant, and they now have Plasma by default on all Tuxedo computers through Tuxedo OS. Another avenue to improve this trend is making the LTS version of KDE encompass apps and frameworks, when currently it only focuses on the desktop. And they're also looking at how to consolidate efforts on various distros or shipping a reference unique KDE distro in collaboration with hardware vendors. Now, it's super interesting to me to see that most hardware vendors focus on shipping something based on KDE as their default desktop environment. But when you look at the major distros, most of them ship GNOME by default. So I think that dichotomy is pretty interesting to look at. And what's also interesting to see is that a lot of hardware vendors are starting to recognize that Linux is a viable alternative to ship on their hardware. So let's hope this trend continues. Now, more KDE news as Kate and Kwrite move to the new hamburger menu style that's been slowly making its way to default KDE apps. For now, it shows the traditional menu instead of curating a set of predetermined actions, but that's a goal for the future. And of course, people who prefer the menu bar will always be able to restore it. Kate's welcome screen also got more features, and the Plasma Wayland session now supports high-resolution scroll wheels. Smaller improvements include Dolphin no longer opening up a new window after extracting or compressing an archive using the context menu, Discover being made more responsive, Plasma widgets will no longer respond to minimize or maximize keyboard shortcuts, there's a new full-screen blend effect when changing the theme in KDE, which should make the transition less jarring, and KDE apps will now more reliably be raised to the top when opened externally, as in not through the main menu. There are also a ton of bug fixes for plasma crashes, rearranging displays, or for Wayland. Most of these improvements will make their way to KDE Plasma 5.27 or the next KDE gear release, and the bug fixes should be applied to existing, already out versions of KDE. Firefox got a new release, version 106, which brings one big nice feature, the ability to edit PDFs from the browser, including writing text, drawing, and adding signatures, something that is still a pain on Linux. 
On top of that, swipe to navigate using two fingers is now enabled on Linux as well, which means you can finally use your touchpad to go back and forward, something that has been missing for years at that point. It will only work on Wayland for now though, and uses an arrow that progressively grows to show the interaction, instead of the way better stack of web pages used in GNOME Web or Safari on Mac, but it's still a nice first step. There's also the new Firefox View tab that lets you find content you previously navigated to, it lets you access tabs from other devices, and change the look of the browser thanks to what they call colorways, of which there are 18, and that lets you change the whole color of the browser. This last feature seems to be annoying some users because it's the first thing in the tab bar and because it basically tells you to use Firefox on other devices to sync your tabs. But honestly, I think it's really nice and it's a nice way for me to not have to dig through my history, which I never find anything in. So props for them, I like it. LibreOffice is now officially on the Microsoft Store for Windows. Why do I mention this here? Well, because it was never really there before, and this opened the door to tons of unofficial clones that charged unholy amounts of money for copies of the suite that might very well have been completely unsafe. By making LibreOffice officially available, they can at least ensure that users can have the real experience, although they also charge for the suite, 4.59 euros, and this money will be reinvested in the development of the Office suite. They will still provide it for free on their website, and they still recommend regular users use that free of charge version. For companies, they also recommend versions that are supported by third-party companies. So I'm not sure who the paid version on the store is for exactly, but people who want to only get their software through the Windows Store can now at least use LibreOffice. This also gives Windows users who would like to donate to LibreOffice an easier way to do it. They can just buy the software on the Windows Store and the money will go partly to LibreOffice and partly to Microsoft. It's way easier than trying to log in or create a new account on LibreOffice's website to donate through an unknown means, I guess. And let's wrap up with some gaming news. First, we have MU Deck, a nice little piece of software that lets you automate the process of setting up emulators. It supports a gigantic number of consoles, from the old Ataris to the Wii U and the Switch, and it now has a GUI to make it easier to use. It also lets you back up your saves to the cloud and has performance improvements all over. It's something I have to try on my Steam Deck because I've been craving some PlayStation 1 gaming recently and yeah, that, that's going to be the way to do it. Wine 7.19 is also out with a better VKD3D version and support for MPEG-4 audio. 17 bugs were also fixed, including for Resident Evil Revelations 2, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Sonic Adventure DX, and more. The Steam Deck also passed the 6000 mark for verified games. This includes almost 2400 certified titles and 3600 playable ones. Newly added games include the very recent Uncharted collection on PC, Darksiders 3, or Resident Evil 7. Finally, it looks like Valve are sneaky little developers, as they have a Proton Hotfix branch that they use to push updates to better support games right after they are released. Examples include Cyberpunk 2077, Street Fighter VI, or Gotham Knights, which all received updates through Proton and were switched to the Proton Hotfix branch by default to allow all users to get the best support possible. It's pretty cool to see them doing this kind of stuff, because if you had to wait for a full-on version of Proton, it means that your game might not run for weeks or run badly for weeks, so props to them. Linux gaming might be a hack, but it's absolutely a beautiful one and it never fails to impress me. Exactly like today's sponsor. Tuxedo is a company based in Germany and they sell laptops and desktops worldwide that run Linux out of the box. And if you're wondering what is the advantage of buying a device that runs Linux out of the box compared to buying any generic PC and installing Linux, well, it removes all the guesswork and the elbow grease needed to make a new computer work under Linux. When you buy from Tuxedo, you know that everything is supported. You can select one of their multiple popular distributions, or you can just slap your own and call it a day. Everything will work because the hardware has been picked to run specifically well on Linux. And they have a huge range of devices from Ultrabooks, Nux, big gaming towers, big gaming laptops, big non-gaming laptops, 
whatever you want, you name it. You can have your custom keyboard layout, you can have your own logo on the back. They have something for each price point. So yeah, if you need a new device, stop reading old forum posts and wondering if something is going to actually work. Just buy something that does and click the link in the description below to do that. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, there's also a dislike button. And if you want to help me make more of these videos, well, you have a super thanks button or a PayPal link in the description, or you also have links to my Patreon page or YouTube memberships. Both get access to a weekly podcast on Monday, where I discuss Linux, open source, my personal life, how the channel is going, everything. And you also get to vote on the next topics that I'll cover. So check them out in the description below. And in the meantime, thank you guys for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.